Today, we talk about documenting traditional cultures and Mask, a book by Chris Rainier on Behind the Shot. Hi, once again, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel, your host, and this is the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion and all those stories and challenges that happen in between. Before we get into today's guest, and today's guest is, I say this often, but this one really, really fits. I have a very special guest for us today, my first National Geographic photographer and a man that is a legend in the type of photography that he does. So I want to remind you that the show notes for this show and any show that we do here on Behind the Shot, they are available for you at BehindTheShot.tv. There will be a blog post associated with this show where you will be able to read some information about my guest. And today is the longest blog post I've ever written. And also, uh, there'll be a gallery of Chris's work that you can go see. And trust me, you want to do that. You're going to want to go visit his website as well. First of all, let me mention that at the time this airs, the first Behind the Shot critique show that I'm doing is live on the YouTube channel for Behind the Shot. I'm doing them with uh, Don Komarechka of the Photo Geek Weekly podcast. Don and I had a blast doing it. We went through 22 images. We went way longer than we planned. The next one, I promise, will be shorter and less images. But go check it out. It's at the Behind the Shot uh, uh, YouTube channel for uh, seeing the critique show. I just lost my train of thought, which was really weird to do on camera. If you want to get your picture into that critique session, it's easy to do. Go to Flickr. Sign up for an account on Flickr, and it can be the free account. This isn't going to cost you anything. Join the Behind the Shot group, and then submit your image to the group, and make sure that you tag it with BTS Critique. You, if you don't want your image critiqued, submit your image to the group anyway. But we only critique the ones where people ask by tagging it with BTS Critique. Something else I wanted to mention to you that just came through my email today. As you may very well know, I'm a fan of Platypod. And the folks over at Platypod sent me an email to to warn me ahead of time that their Black Friday sale is live now. And they have like three different really cool bundles. I'm not going to try and give you all the details right now. I just want to let you know if you've ever considered buying a Platypod and I love them, head on over to platypod.com and check out the Black Friday bundles that they've got. And that brings us to today's guest. Now, first of all, let me just say, Chris Rainier, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Steve. It's a great honor and pleasure. I'm really excited about uh, just sharing some images and talking to you. Yeah, and I'm so excited to have you on. And I have to say thanks to our mutual friends, Scott and Lou, for connecting me with you, because they have been instrumental in getting you on this show. You are my first ever National Geographic photographer or National Geographic explorer to have on the show. And you're, as, as I'm researching you, Really, honestly, your resume is is somewhat crazy good. It's not just good. It's off the charts. So let's talk about you a little bit. I want to talk about your new book that's coming out. You're an educator. You're an author. But mainly you're known in the National Geographic world and, and your photo work as a documentary photographer and filmmaker. Is that how you describe what you do? Yeah, I, uh, I'm fascinated with cultures. I'm fascinated with uh, different diversity of, of humans around the world. So I've really committed my career and uh, my life in a way to being on the road and documenting very cool, interesting cultural rituals around the planet. Well, and one of the things I saw on your website that I thought was really interesting on, on a, both a filmmaker and a photographer site was documenting endangered cultures and languages. And that's correct. And that was fascinating to me. You are the director of the Cultural Sanctuaries uh, Foundation. Explain that to me. It, it, I, I've got a small description I wrote, but you can probably do it more justice than me. Yeah, for for close to 20 years at the National Geographic, I helped direct a program with a group of linguists and anthropologists really focused on Uh, highly endangered languages. And why that is so important is that when a language dies, 
a communication system, a way of looking at the world for a culture dies. So, you know, there were, I'm not a linguist, I'm not an anthropologist, I'm a visual storyteller. So the, the group of us worked together to identify highly endangered languages, which then become the kind of uh, indicator for the culture has the potential of dying. And languages die for many, many different reasons. Every two weeks, a traditional language dies. Wait, a, wait um, say that again? Every two weeks, there's somewhere around the planet that an elder, a traditional wisdom keeper within a community, passes away. And 80% of the world's cultures, languages, are oral. So when that elder dies, it's like burning down a library. It's like a huge uh, Smithsonian library of knowledge goes with them unless it's been documented. So that's what our goal, our mission was all about, was getting to these highly endangered wow. knowledge bases and documenting them and building a maybe for the first time a dictionary. And my role in that was to do the visual component and the video component of rolling the video when we were interviewing these guys and archiving it for future generations. And this is the Enduring Voices Language Project? That is correct. Okay. And so what, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I was just gonna say, that's fascinating to me, that statistic that you threw out. Um, you're also the director of the All Roads Photography Program. You're an that editor for NG Traveler. Correct. And I have to say this, and I should have made sure it was okay to say it before I got you on, but I'm going to anyway. You were Ansel Adams' last photographic assistant? That is correct. So I had the you great took privilege. pictures with Ansel Adams. I did, and uh, it was a great, great honor. I was just a little whippersnapper. Uh, of 19 years old, I had just graduated from photography school in Santa Barbara, California, and he, of course, lived in Carmel, California. And so um, I was asked to be his assistant, and so uh, it was a real a remarkable education, remarkable privilege to be around such a great uh, mind, a great uh, educator, teacher himself. And, you know, while he had done the, the huge body of work that we know so well in the 1940s and 50s into the 60s, he was still shooting up a storm in the early 1980s. So we, we often went photographing in Yosemite or uh, just south of his wow. house in Big Sur. So it was a real privilege and a real kind of foundation for me and my career, because what I really got from him was the sense of using photography as a social tool, which he did to, to help preserve many of the national parks in our country, from obviously Yosemite to Yellowstone to the Grand Canyon. And yet all of his photographs were beautiful. They were art pieces. So I, I began to truly understand that you could create art and photographic art, but yet still have a social message and a social agenda. Yeah, that's interesting to me. And that, that yes, uh, that, that, that photographic art can, can literally make a difference. Similarly, you know, and what's interesting is every other art style, songs, for example, right? We understand exactly. that we remember moments in our lives by the songs that we're playing in the time or the protest song that came out reminds Absolutely. us of Kent State or, or whatever. Photographs do the same thing. Iconic photographs tell a story of our history and our time. And Absolutely. Yeah. And Absolutely. in many ways, like you say, they can save cultures, which is interesting. Your, your list of, of people you've worked with or for, I need to get out because again, Wow. United Nations, Amnesty International, Time Magazine, Smithsonian Institute, New York Times, Life, more, more, more. List goes on and on. And again, award winner, lecturer. Um, the lectures, the people you've done lectures to were interesting to me. You've obviously lectured for Nat Geo. Uh, TED Global, UN, Google, Apple, you're, you're lecturing for tech companies. I found that interesting. And you've got two websites. And so I want to touch on the differences in the two websites, because if you're watching the video version of this show, the, the addresses are coming up underneath Chris periodically. 
And I want you to understand that it's not the same one if you're just blinking by it really quick. It's two different addresses. And so I want to kind of go into those. So first of all, the chrisrainier.org. That's your main, I'm guessing, like portfolio site, right? What do you use chrisrainier.org for? It's really a um, internet based uh, uh, business card. It's we live in a world where obviously people, an editor, a book publisher, uh, someone who's interested in me potentially lecturing halfway around the world, uh, I can just send them that uh, address and boom, there you are. It's a, a mini um, sort of introduction to the, the work I do. The second website, massjourney.com, is really focused on the book uh, that I just have out on uh, traditional mask rituals around the world. Which I want to touch on the book really quick. And then I also want to touch on the Rome Awards before we get into the picture. Absolutely. Because that's an interesting one too. Uh, but the book, I've got a couple, the, the photo that we're going to talk about today is from the book Mask by Chris. And I have seen some of these pictures. Trust me, the video will, is not going to do them justice. Even the website really isn't going to do them justice. I have seen these pictures in high resolution. The amount of detail and color uh, uh, subtlety that's in these images is nothing short of amazing. It, I, I would venture to say, I don't know, when I pulled a couple of them up, bad words came out because I don't think I've ever seen photography at that type of view uh, in my life at this level. I, I just don't think that I have. So I'm going to pull up. I've got not the one we're going to talk about, which is from the book, but I've got like four or five other shots that I'm going to put up. And while I put them up, just to give people a taste of the book, tell me about the book a little bit. And I'll just show these while you're talking about the book, okay. um, because the book is a fascinating idea to me. So tell me about the book Mask. Okay, thank you. Um, well, as I, I put into context before, my life's mission is really about documenting traditional cultures and cultural rituals around the world. So I really uh, have focused on the many variations of how those rituals uh, manifest themselves. And of course, being a photographer, it has to manifest itself uh, in a visual way and a, a, a fascinating way. So my photographic career, once I left the Ansel Adams studio, was uh, very shortly I ended up in New Guinea, which is an island just north of Australia. It is truly where Stone Age cultures still exist in a way where, uh, you know, the primordial us, the primitive, if you want to use that word, us still exist. People that live uh, on the frayed edge of the map of traditional societies, men and women that have one foot out of the Garden of Eden, so to speak, and live deep in these forests. So I went there on assignment in 1985, fell in love with the culture and what I saw and the potential. And I decided to spend the next 10 years of my life um, for six months of each year in between assignments and living there and photographing all the different rituals. What manifested itself uh, again and again were traditional mask rituals. These masks that were made of the forest, the wood, the bark, the leaves, the berries, the shells on the beach. And uh, I fell in love with why, uh, what are these masks? Why do we wear masks? And where else do we wear masks? And so, Basically, from 1985 until this book got published uh, literally this September, it's been a 30-odd-year journey in search of the meaning of the Mass. You know, since the dawn of mankind, we, we have been asking the question, who are we, why are we here, and what is my purpose? And I think masks play an integral role in... Um, uh, discussing that question in different traditional cultures around the world. And what's interesting, I've been putting these images up and there's, a, I've got a bunch of them, the the one on the beach, the one in the snow. And right now I've got the one up that's the actual cover of the book. Yes. And what's interesting to me is the variance that you see in the designs. And then when we get to the image that we're going to talk about today, 
Um, it's again, each one is so unique and so different. If people want to buy the book, where do they go? Well, um, I'm always for supporting your local uh, bookstore, um, depending on where people live. If they have a great sort of art uh, boutique bookstore, they can certainly um, order it. If you live, you know, on the moon or the uh, small little community in the middle of nowhere, certainly Amazon uh, carries it. So it's widely available, Amazon uh, I, it's at Barnes and Noble. So, um, but you know, it's wherever, I, wherever you get books pretty much. And, and if they don't have wherever, it, they can, they can probably order it. And just to remind people, quickly. maskjourney.com for mask, the book by Chris Rainier. Right. Uh, uh, before, and that's singular tense mask, not masks, so not masks, mask. mask. And exactly. it's all caps, just the word. Ma- it's not the mask. It's just mask. That is correct. I want to touch on one last thing before we get into the shot. And and sure. uh, I'm just, again, I'm fascinated by what you do. And there's an organization called Rome Media. Yes. And they're doing the Rome Awards. And Rome is an interesting organization. I believe Travis Rice, who's one of the judges, actually, with you, you're a judge there for the Rome Awards, um, is one of the founders of this. And it's kind of celebrating outdoor adventure and outdoor sports photography. Uh, if I'm, it, it, did I sum that up right? How? Uh, that's, that's really it. it. You know, in a world that's gone uh, mad and um, is so depressing on a day-to-day basis, if you follow the news too much, uh, it is a powerful, wonderful reminder that out beyond, you know, civilization where the road ends and the mountains begin, Uh, There is a world out there that we need to celebrate, cherish, and preserve, and Rome uh, identifies that and celebrates that, uh, rejoices in uh, humans just getting out and going skiing, climbing, biking, fishing, just sitting on a mountain and taking in a beautiful sunset. The world is... Uh, in a remarkable, it is a remarkable, remarkable place. And we need to celebrate that. And that's what's so great about Rome. It does that so very well. Yeah. And on the website, it says Chronicles Outdoor Adventure and Sports. But really, as you look through the website, you'll realize it's not chronicling. That sound That's too dry to me. It's its really yeah. celebrating it. It reminded Absolutely. me when I, when I went to the site, I had a guy on my show recently named Andy Day, who writes for F-Stoppers. And mm. he photographs parkour, right? Outdoor building climbing, but he does it outdoors at these old, um, you know, monuments in ex Russian, you know, provinces or countries. And it's, and it's fascinating. And he would be fascinated by this. Your judge, your judging panel is insane. Just to give a couple names out. Chris Rainier is a judge. Travis Rice is a judge. Ron Dawson, Chase Jarvis, all judges. So go check it out. I put the website up a little while ago, but let me just say it for the audio listeners. It's Rome, R-O-A-M, RomeMedia.com. And if you go to RomeMedia.com slash awards, that will tell you more about the the competition and the awards and all of that type of thing. So. And if I could just quickly Anything you want, man. I literally just an hour and a half ago finished judging and it... uh, it was remarkable because I spent the last four days uh, drowning in a sort of sea of amazing images. What people are doing uh, to push the envelope of adventure and exploration and, and getting out in nature and having cameras along with it. And it again reminded me, they were remarkable underwater shots with, you know, deep in caves. They were star trails. There were, you know, the Northern Lights. And that's what I love about photography, especially now. We're at this remarkable time where the technology is is limitless. So we we just have to come up with uh, what our imagination says out in nature, whether it's in the middle of the night, middle in the cave, or down under the water, and the cameras can do it. And these images reflect that. So I was absolutely blown away by the images. Well, and and the other thing is with technology, if you stick 
advancing technology in people's hands, humans will find a way still to push it to its limits. And Absolutely. then you give them more advanced technology and they'll find a way to push that to its limits. And that to me is the beauty of where photography is today is it is a merge of amazing tech, right? To where you end up with iPhones that really, right. you know, as long as you don't need additional lighting, you can do absolutely amazing stuff with your phone. Um, the award show is December 5th, so that everybody knows. Again, go to romamedia.com uh, slash awards, and you can kind of check everything out. So now let's pick your brain on photography a little bit. Okay. Uh, um, I have a couple of questions that are not related to the shot, doing what you do. There are people, I have a friend who goes to Papua New Guinea and takes pictures and things like that. And, and there are a lot of people who do travel photography to unusual exotic places. What is the most, with your experience level that it is, what's the most important thing that photographers should keep in mind when photographing other cultures? If you were to pick one main, if I could give you one thing, you know, what should they do when photographing other cultures? Beautiful question. Um, the way I like to answer that is, of course, we're eager and impatient to get the image and, and make a beautiful image, but treat people the way you want to be treated. The other comment is the quality of the portrait is in direct proportion to the quality of the relationship you have with your subject. I always go in I sit down with people, I sit down with the elders, I sit down with the kids, even before I take my camera out. And I wanna build a rapport, I wanna build a relationship, and that relationship may only take five minutes. So we're not talking about weeks, right. though. Spend a week sometimes, there, yeah, it's not. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'm uh, able to do that, but a lot of times I'm not. But the, the whole thing is treat, people the way you want to be treated. And the way I love to look at it is when I walk away from taking an image, I want them to have an experience that is as fun and respectful and potent as the relationship and the kind of payoff that I got, which of course, hopefully is a successful image. But, you know, we, we take images, we don't ask, and I think we need to ask more and more. And, you know, it, it, after 30 years of doing this, and many of these traditional cultures are hesitant, um, uh, concerned, or uh, verging on suspicious sometimes. So I have to work very, very hard to have an authentic, real, respectful relationship. And it always pays off in terms of the quality of the image. And it, you, you, said so eloquently what a friend of mine, Rick Salmon, uh, says, which is the camera looks both ways. And it really, absolutely, it really does. Is there one main tip you would give that people avoid when venturing in to document other cultures? Don't eat all the food that's put in front of you. <laughs> that's a good um, one. That's actually I, a really I, good one. And if they put it in front of you, eat it, eat something. <laughs> Because Eat they, or, they took the or, time to put that plate together for you. It's disrespectful if you don't. Absolutely. And I'm being facetious, but, you know, you get really good at sort of like, hey, look at Haley's Comet out there. And then you pour the the water that isn't boiled down behind you, or you pretend right. to eat more food than you, you do. But of course, that was not the question you were really asking. I think the important thing, um, you know, is just take your time. I think... Uh, what I've really been given the privilege of with National Geographic is time. And that's one of the most precious commodities that we can have in uh, whether it's taking a landscape photograph or connecting with culture is to have enough time on your hands to make sure that when you click that shutter, the relationship is intact, the light is perfect, Everything is humming in a kind of beautiful synergy, and that's when great images are taken. Okay, uh, so let's get into this shot, and I'm going to try and do okay. what I do every single show, and every single show I make a joke about the fact that it's not going to work, but I'm going to try it anyway, and here we go again. And for some odd reason, it feels like it gets harder every show. I'm going to try and describe <laughs> this photo, and this photo is from Chris's book, Mask, 
it is a one by one ratio. So it is a square photo, which we'll get into in a minute, but it's, it's black and white. It's what's interesting is it to me, it doesn't feel black and white. It almost feels sepia like, uh, there's a tone of some sort to it and it's in an, it's in a village. Uh, the buildings look Adobe almost, uh, as a, you know, a homemade clay. There is, I'm going to get to the guy last because the buildings actually to me are fascinating. There's a wooden rickety door that doesn't appear, you know, it's not a door like is on hinges. It's leaned against the doorway. Next to that is a tree pole. Like it's a tree, but it has no top, no branches, no nothing. It's just the tree and two branches that split at the top as though it's intended to hang something on. Behind the subject in the picture is another wall. And that has tree trunks coming out of the bottom of that, which was really, really interesting to me. And then there's the guy, the or gal. Uh, you can't tell in this outfit. It's a very full body, traditional costume, kind of feathery looking almost, or fabricy looking, very shaggy is a good way to word it. And the mask is a round wooden mask with a lot of geometrical shapes, uh, circles for eyes, nose and mouth. The eyebrows connect. There's a vertical going up. Really, honestly, I can't do this any justice whatsoever. So let's start here. Where is this, Chris? Well, great description, Steve. You're very, very observant because everything you've described about the image is perfectly accurate. This is in West Africa, and West Africa is one of the great epicenters for uh, traditional mask rituals. The great museums like the American Museum of Natural History in New York, Paris, London, uh, Frankfurt, all have a collection of masks from West Africa because they are truly, truly remarkable. And the amazing thing is these dances are still alive. This isn't some ancient ritual from a bygone era. These are masks that are worn every single week. Uh, for so this wasn't, particular- okay, I got I to clarify that. So this was not what I thought it was then. This wasn't pull out the old costume that you wear for photos. This is a, this is a regular occurrence. This is a regular occurrence at the rituals that they have. So they have rituals around initiation, childhood to adulthood, adulthood into a warrior status. Um, uh, after the, the vegetable, vegetable harvest is, is uh, about to happen, all these different kind of occurrences that happen, if not on a weekly basis, almost several times a month to to all year long. And this is a a particular tribe that have these almost comical masks. It has a kind of comical look to it, but there's also a serious intensity. And in fact, all of the masks in this area were so respected by artists like Picasso that they said at the time that the Cubist movement started that they were profoundly influenced by a number of these masks. And you see the geometric patterns around the face. There are other examples in the book of this very kind of linear, modern looking designs on uh, the mask rituals. So um, there are butterfly masks. This is the sun mask. It looks like the face of a sun. And so these masks represent different gods and goddesses that essentially the, the, the shaman who's wearing the mask is in communication with the gods. And this is like a conduit to the spiritual world to kind of keep everything in balance. So there isn't a famine or there isn't a, 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 you know, a flood that destroys their crops. But again, the real thing here is this, this is alive and pulsing and still happening in the 21st century. When you went to this village and, and that explains the Adobe type buildings behind it, that this is an African, I was, I was going to, I would have guessed Africa probably. And those of you that see the picture will know what I mean. And, I, and the Picasso thing was interesting because I do see the cubism and the, the geometry yes. involved in this thing. Yes. The detail 
is just insane here. I mean, absolutely insane. You've got to see this, people. Go to the website, behindtheshot.tv, find the blog post for this, or go to massjourney.com and you can see it there. Although you won't know which one it is, so just look at all of them. Um, <laughs> was he wearing this? Did you ask him to put this on? This was a particular ritual that I knew was going to happen on a certain set of days. The way I work is that um, I will find uh, what I call a fixer in a particular country. So, you know, the great thing about working for National Geographic is you have a remarkable Rolodex of photographers that have worked all over the world. So I can call up someone who's done an assignment in West Africa and say, hey, you know, who did you work with? You got a good ground operator. Uh, I'll email them and say, look, you know, I, I want to photograph these masks. Tell me when they're going to have a festival or ritual. And then I begin over a year's period of putting together a trip that can work. So I've shown up knowing that over the next couple of days, there's going to be a series of, of festivals. Then I work uh, rituals and then I work with uh, my translators is to essentially say to that guy while he's dancing in the festival, when you're finished with the dance, I found an alleyway just 200 yards down into the village. Can I take you there? and photograph you there. So I'm constructing images. And I think it's really from my Ansel Adams days where I've set, I've created a, a set. I've, I often say that what I've done is create um, the stage and then I bring in the actors. So right. the, comp the composition, that door, the angles are not an accident. Even the space above his head there's a precise okay. space there. And and when we get to composition, that's one of my questions for you. So <laughs> I'm going to come back to that in a minute because sure, sure. there are some compositional things in here that are fascinating to me. Um, but again, the detail. What was this shot with? So it's, I love Hasselblad. It is just a sublimely beautiful camera. Um it's uh, the 500 series, so it's simple. I don't like a lot of um, uh, electronics, especially when I'm in the tropics. It just opens itself up for a lot of problems. Um, you know, I still shoot traditional black and white films. So this is tri film. I had it developed, and then I uh, get a proof sheet. I pick out the particular negatives. I have that scanned, and then I go into a number of things. One thing that you picked up on uh, in, in terms of the tint, I use Snapseed a lot. Snapseed oh. is a Google um, yep. free app. You can download it. It's a consumer product, but I love it. It is so intuitive. It has a set of um, what's called vintage kind of profiles. And I love playing around with that. This, uh, you know, many of these things you can do on Photoshop and Lightroom, but I just, I love the way Snapseed works. So I often will take my black and white images and my color for that matter and slightly tint them just ever so slightly. So I'm fascinated now with that kind of space where black and white meets color and the color is so desaturated that it's almost like an old fashioned autochrome. Right. And then the black and white has just a slight tint, but I don't want to do this heavy sepia or make it look too obvious. I'm playing around with, with this kind of subconscious thing right in that space where color meets black and white. And, and which is interesting because as I was describing it earlier and I said, it's black and white, but yet it's not, I, I didn't really want to come out and say sepia because right. it's clearly toned. Yes. But yet it's just so tastefully subtle. And the Snapseed, originally, by the way, from the people when it was Nick, and they had Nick yeah. Color Effects Pro and Nick Silver Effects Pro. And when Google bought them, Google got rid of that. DxO owns the Nick stuff now, but they kept Snapseed. And yes. I use Snapseed regularly if I'm shooting a concert and I'm shooting for Live Nation or something. When I'm done with the three songs that I shoot, they'll often say to me, can I get a picture right away for social media? Well, I'll use Wi-Fi off of my Canon, dump it onto my iPhone, use Snapseed to crop, process, sharpen, tint, whatever, and then email it off to them. It's just, if you really honestly, I still think it's a, even though, yes, we have Photoshop on iPad now, and yes, we have Lightroom, I just, I love that app. The lighting in this, 
it looks like natural light. Is it only natural light? Did you add light? Do you ever add light? So in this particular situation, uh, it is all natural light. I am adamant about not shooting in bright sunshine. Um, I work, and especially when you're in the tropics, you know, 95% of the day is bright sunshine. So I work in that, that half an hour in the morning and that 45 minutes in the afternoon, and predominantly most of my shots are in the afternoon, either as the sun has just gone down or it has gone down. So you get that soft bouquet of light. Um, and then when I'm in Snapseed or Lightroom, I want the image to have its own illuminosity, its own light. So I'm not fighting the light. I've got this perfect negative or digital file that I can uh, have that luminosity coming through in the image. So. I do occasionally use um, a, a softbox. So some of the images in the book actually have a light and it's just a Norman 400B uh, on a softbox, uh, on a monopod, off 45 degrees angle, just barely lighting it. And my philosophy about uh, flash and light is if you can see, if you're aware that it's lit, then you're not using the flash well. It should be that it, it just adds to it, but doesn't overtake the message of the image. Okay, so you you just, I'm, you're going to be on every show now. You just <laughs> took me down the road. This so we got out of that, that yes, you also use Lightroom. Yes, you also use Flash. You like a, 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 a soft box. Your lighting strategy, I could learn from you all day long and just absolutely love it. Um, and well, again, you. the Snapseed thing, I just love because it really is powerful. Composition. Well, wise. if I could just tell you a very, very quick story, and I know we've got lots to cover, but to that point is I, and to the point on your iPhone, I actually now shoot a fair amount on my iPad Pro and I've got Snapseed loaded up to it. One of the reasons, one of the reasons is I want to be able to present the image to someone. It breaks the ice. It makes them feel very, very comfortable. Um, I've loaded some software up that it, it's got a, a larger file size. I prefer to shoot you know, on my SLR uh, and then dump it over into the iPad. But very quickly, a very funny story. Way out in the middle of nowhere in Mongolia, this Kazakh, he's got uh, this beautiful eagle on his arm. He's at a central casting. He's stunningly handsome with this fur jacket, the clouds. Everything was perfect. I shot it on my iPad uh, just to show him. And I showed him and I could see he was really excited about it. And so through the translator, um, I said, I'd love to give you this image. Do you have an address? And again, we're five days drive out in the middle of nowhere with no electricity. And I said, I'd love to send it. Uh, you know, once I get it printed and through the translator, he says, no. And as he's saying, no, he whips out his iPhone. He says, just airdrop it to me and I'll load it up to Facebook. What? And that's, that is where we are in the world now is that, you know, the, the amount of images being uh, uploaded on the web is approaching 2 billion a year. I, everywhere I go, even to the most isolated villages in Africa and Mongolia, people have smartphones and they're taking pictures. And that's what I love about this international language of photography. Oh, man. Okay, yeah, that story was worth it. So I, 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 got, I, I mentioned I was going to touch on the composition. I need to do that yes, because sir. including the door, including as much of the ground as you did, the tree stump, the stump coming out of the building, all of that, and even a little triangle of sky, all of that really makes the composition in this shot. So in your, as you mentioned earlier, everything was well thought out, including the space above the mask. And that was one of the things, the fact that you kept that mask from intersecting with the top of that building in the sky is that's what composition is supposed to be, people. Study this image. It's one of the first things that jumped out at me was, this isn't just head in a clean spot, right? This is a giant mask, and, and you still did head in a clean spot. And 
okay, people say to me, well, how far from an edge should I be? I don't know. I can't tell you that. This is it, right? Enough that it's clear that it was not intersecting as perfect. I am curious about one thing. I struggle with, and I mentioned this to Dennis Reggie, the wedding photographer, when he was on, because we did his shot of John Kennedy Jr. and Carolyn Bissett coming out of the mm. chapel, and it's got a Dutch angle to it. And I'm normally not a fan of Dutch angle. And that's probably because in my mind, shooting live music, I always look at a Dutch angle and think that drum set would be sliding off the stage right now. Uh, yes. But the way Dennis used it in that shot is a, is a good example in that because they were walking out and they were he was kissing her hand, it added motion to it. Yes. It also, as a side benefit, allowed him to leave a sign in on this 1700s or 1800s, whatever it was, church, so that the viewer could read that and go, oh, this really is an old dilapidated chapel. Yes. So it added so much. And here, it's the same thing. This, the Dutch angle here, and it's not really even Dutch, it's not that much, but it it transports you into the courtyard. It's less photograph and it's more I'm standing yeah. here. When you do an angle on a shot, what are you thinking? Well, I, and I, I, I love again and appreciate that you see that the angle is slightly skewed. Um, and it's really uh, subtle. It's very subtle. It's very subtle. What I like to do is when I want to kind of create a tension within the image that the viewer will not even consciously be aware of, just subconscious, I tilt the horizon. And sometimes just to ensure that I get it right, I'll definitely shoot normal and I'll tilt it slightly and yet again, another bracket even more. And then when I'm in post looking at it, I'll make that definition. So I was really acutely aware that um, I wanted the composition to incorporate the mask, the big round mask, but not to have any lines intersect or interfere with the composition of the mask. So I remember vividly, you know, the, the guy in the mask was very tall. I'm tall, six foot one, but even then I had to stand on my tippy toes to ensure that that line behind the mask didn't intersect. Everything in a photograph for me, again, as I've said uh, to my students so many times, should have an intention should look like it's there all the way from the door to the adobe, the slight Dutch, as you call it. Um, I, I really compose images like a piece of music. Everything has an intention and a sweet spot. A spot for every instrument. And, and I agree. And to me, it, I'm so glad to hear somebody say, you know, everything matters, right? What you include in a photo matters so much, but also people should keep in mind what you don't include in Absolutely. a photo quite often has more voice to it, right? Absolutely. The, the, because the wrong thing in a photo that either draws my attention or simply changes the storyline can, can affect my interpretation as a viewer almost more than the fact that you left something in. So in this particular case, all the things that we've been talking about, including the mask itself, the outfit, the door, the tree, the tree coming out of the bottom, the two walls, the Dutch angle, the, the toning, the dirt floor, the adobe. There's so much in this photo, and yet it's minimalistic. Yes. And, and that, my friend, is brilliant. Well, thank you. I think I've always, you know, again, what I did when I worked for Ansel um, was I... I on my free time, I would take out tracing paper and very gently just uh, trace over the graphic lines, the, the vanishing point, the triangle of the mountain. And then I would do that on uh, two dozen of his images, making sure I didn't destroy any of them. And then I would put the images yeah. away and I'd line up all the tracing paper. And what I began to visualize was the the graphicness of line and design. And I think 
what I've come up with is a philosophy of reducing uh, the the complicatedness of life out there and try and make it very graphic, very simple. What can you take out of an image and still have the message and the composition holding? So it's kind of like I'm spring cleaning. Oh, I don't need that branch. Oh, I don't need that over there. And, you know, I'll move in. I'll turn to the left. I'll turn to the right. I'll lie down on the ground. I'll get up on the ladder. I'll find that sweet spot and decide, oh, don't need that, don't need that. And what is left that still has a clear intention, a clear message, and a point of view? Yeah, well said, really well said. So if people want to see more of your work, your normal website, as in portfolio type website, Chris Rainier, like the mountain, R-A-I-N-I-E-R.org, Chris Rainier.org. And for the book, what's the website again for mask? the book by you maskjourney.com singular on both maskjourney.com all okay. one word maskjourney.com maskjourney.com so go check out this book again i've seen some of these pictures i've seen a good amount of these pictures that chris sent to me as we were going to pick the one we were going to talk about today and the the detail is i i'm not kidding it's like nothing i've ever seen in a photograph chris thank you so much for doing this cuz i know you're busy i know you just got back from uh, from Japan, is that where you were? That's correct. Yeah, so I, I, I know that you've been, been busy lately and I really appreciate your time. Hey, Steve, thanks so much. Um, it's a real great honor and you do a great interview. Thank you. Thank you, that means a lot. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Uh, so again, Chris Rainier, everybody go check out the websites. Let me say them once again, chrisrainier.org and for Mask, which is his new book, maskjourney.com. Make sure that you go check those out. I want to give you a few more just ideas before we leave today. Number one, uh, Flurn, they have been kind enough to give my viewers and listeners a discount. So if you're interested in learning from Aaron Nace and the folks over at Flurn, you can get 20% off a subscription. BT, uh, I'm sorry, Behind the Shot 20. Behind the Shot 20 will get you that discount. That is not a paid advertisement. I want to be very clear. They're not paying me to say that. I just really like what they're doing. They gave us the code, and I think that's kind of cool. Also, if you join the Flickr group for Behind the Shot, submit your images to the Flickr group. We're all having fun over there. And if you also add the tag BTS Critique, then we might pick that shot. Don Komarechka, the, the macro photography genius and the host of Photo Geek Weekly. We're doing our critique shows. Right now, we're doing about, about once a month. We may pick those up a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, if you put BTS critique as a tag on Flickr, we may pick that picture on the next show and uh, use one of your pictures for the critique shows. The first critique show is up. Those are not in the podcast feed. They're only on the YouTube channel because they're so video centric. So make sure you go to the YouTube channel for behind the shot. You can see that there. Also, if you are listening to this show or watching this show in a podcast app, I've got a favor to ask. If you could run by iTunes, wherever you get your podcast, Pandora, Spotify, iHeartMute, wherever, leave us a review, both a star rating and a written review. I'd appreciate it much because it does help with discoverability. So that does it for this episode of Behind the Shot, the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. All the show notes for every episode are up at the website at behindtheshot.com. Dot TV. You can always reach out to me if you've got questions, if you've got feedback, if you've got comments, you can do that on social media. I'm usually on Twitter and I'm usually on Instagram. Other than that, thanks again for joining us and we'll see you in the pit. 